We are in the middle of, or actually kind of somewhere, maybe even wrapping up, transitioning almost maybe. But anyway, we are in a series called Trust Enough to Change. Our theme for the year is trust, and we're digging in and seeing what it takes to change our lives to be true disciples, true followers of Jesus. And one of the things that it takes, perhaps the central thing it takes, is this incredible trust that Jesus is worth it. So we're digging in. Now we started with Samson. Samson trusted God, became a judge, and then had some issues where he trusted something other than God for a while. But when push comes to shove, see what it did there? The columns and the, yeah, okay. When push comes to shove, he trusted in God. And the lesson for us is to trust God, not just in emergencies, but our whole lives. And then we won't get in that kind of trouble where we've got to scream out in crises, right? But if we are in crisis, God is always faithful. Then we looked at Jonathan and how he favored David. Jonathan, who was in line for the throne, his father was on the throne. The natural human thing is for the son to take the throne, the first son. And yet Jonathan trusted God so much that he saw God's work in David. So much so that he gave at the battle of uh, when, when David defeated Goliath, he gave David his royal armament. I see God working in you. You are Israel's future. I see God doing that. And he submitted himself to David and did so for the rest of his life. Uh, just an incredible amount of trust in God and in God's work to put our own pride, our own desires, our own hopes and dreams, aspirations, whatever they might be, in God's hands. And if that means someone else takes it, then praise be to God. God knows what he's doing. What an incredible level of trust. And then we looked at the prodigal son. When he finally came to his senses, there was something that he knew at the bottom of that pigsty that was more rock solid than the earth he was wallowing in. The faithfulness, the goodness of God. Remember his words, even my father's servants same word can be translated slaves, have more than enough food to eat. And here I am, hungry for this pig slop. When being a slave in God's house is more beautiful than the life you've chosen for yourself, then you can trust enough to change. That's a hard place to get, but it's worth working to get there. Then last week we looked at Zacchaeus, the wee little man. I don't know why he has, a, he has an Irish accent, but <clears throat> Zacchaeus wanted to see Jesus so badly, so much, so deeply that social norms didn't matter. Didn't matter that a rich man would never climb a tree in public. Zacchaeus wanted to see Jesus more than he cared about social norms. So he climbed the tree, and when he met Jesus and Jesus came to his home and they spent that day together, his hope was filled and his trust overloaded, and he gave back fourfold to anyone he had cheated. Or he, yeah, he went the extra mile. He trusted God enough that his life was changed and that he was willing to give up that thing that he had worked so hard for, his money, his riches, to repay those that he had wronged. So today, we take our next look. And this one's called Complete Metamorphosis. Now, I want you to do two things for me. First of all, hang on to that scripture reading. If you have your, your, uh, your order of worship, Flip it over to that side and just keep reading that as, as we talk. Look at the perspective. One of the things about trust enough to change that I was supposed to be emphasizing more than I have, and I apologize for this, but is the, 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 the idea of perspective. Perspective matters. Perspective changes the way we process. 
and eventually the way that we trust. That with the wrong perspective, we can actually crumble trust. But with the right perspective, we see God move and work, and trust in us grows. Look in First Chronicles 16 at the reading, and look at the perspective that it is singing from. The greatness of God, His splendor, His majesty, His wonderful acts. Look to the Lord and His strength. Seek His face always. What a beautiful perspective, one that we would do well to adopt and really work on seeing God work and move in the lives of others, in our own life, and in this world. Then I want you to keep the words to everlasting God in your hearts as well. There's a line in there that says he's the defender of the weak. Hang on to that one. Hang on to that one. Hang on to that whole song. Complete metamorphosis is a trust so real that a complete change takes place. And I'm not talking about just a small change. I'm talking about 180 degrees. So take your Bibles, get your Bibles, and turn with me. Or actually, I put in my notes here. I said, uh, turn with me in your Bibles, be they scrolls or rolls. <laughs> Paper, scrolls, rolls, swipe on you. Okay, never mind. Joshua chapter 2. But before we jump into Joshua chapter 2, the specifics, a word from our sponsor, Integrity. A question for all you God followers. followers is lying wrong? This is audience participation. Okay, thank you. Commandment number nine, Deuteronomy chapter five, verse 20 says, and you shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. Won't you be my neighbor? Now we all know that that's right, but wait a minute. Before any of us, before any of us throws a stone, John chapter eight style stones, that is, I want to ask a question of the gentleman in the room. And I use that term loosely. Which of you, if your wife were to ask you, does this make me look fat? Would answer, you betcha. Elephant size. Woohoo. I don't see any hands. Hmm. Not brave enough, huh? Would you dare to even ask if it's a trick question? No, no, that's right. We're not that dumb. We would all say, you look Great! Why did the women answer that? That was weird. You look great, honey. Woo! woo. I'm going to have to take a baseball bat to keep all the guys away from you. And we consider that approach not a lie. We consider that life-saving wisdom. So what's the deal? Well, as we continue the introductory part, into Joshua chapter 2. Let's take a quick idea of this, a quick look at this idea of false witnessing. In Deuteronomy, that word is Saul. It means vain and worthless futility, a negative reference to an entity or an event. It indicates that whatever content is being addressed is worthless and certainly incapable of ascertaining the truth, of figuring out the truth. The same word is found in the third commandment. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God, of Yahweh your God, in vain. Same word as false witness in commandment number nine. You shall not misuse, the NIV says, the name of the Lord your God. ESV says in vain. So what the writer is trying to get us to grasp is that we will not lift up the name of God in vain, uselessly, worthlessly. So this isn't merely don't say GD. This is really also addressing when we use God's name flippantly. like they do everywhere. Oh my, are they really addressing God with a concern? God's name is holy. God's name is 
valuable. God's name is sacred. And to say it flippantly is to disregard the greatness of God and the holiness of God, the beauty of God. So the idea of lying to your neighbor, of bearing false witness, says that your neighbor is important. Your neighbor deserves the truth. And as a child of God, you are required. You are expected to live the truth as God has lived the truth with you. And if God's name is holy and we dare not abuse it, then in our attempt to make hallowed his name, Matthew chapter 6, our words matter. And there's no place for flippancy, for devaluing. Commandment number nine is talking about saying and doing the right thing. Remember for the Jewish nation, for our cousins, the Jews, the difference between saying you would do and do something and doing something, there was no difference. That God's words were action. You know, in the Spanish Bible, this is so interesting. John chapter one, in the beginning was the word. That's translated verb in the Spanish translation. In the beginning, there was the verb. The idea is action. God's word is action. As followers of God, our words are action. Action that reflect the character and the life and the nobility and the goodness of God. And that reflect our commitment to his holy name. Remember the second greatest commandment is like the first. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Love your neighbor as yourself. There is no separation between those two. That Greek word for like means that they are inextricably tied together. So we can't say we love God if we don't love, actively love our neighbors. So bearing false witness to a neighbor has no place in the kingdom. Commandment number nine is about kingdom thinking, kingdom speaking, kingdom acting, kingdom living. It's about getting away from selfish, self-centered, self-pleasing, speaking and thinking and acting. All right, with that said, let's get on with this week's Trust Enough to Change, Complete Metamorphosis. Now, I'm sure we all are aware of what that word means. It's great big. Don't you love when somebody says, now, obviously, we all know what it means, and then they always define it, which is what I'm going to do, too. What's the big example of metamorphosis? Butterfly, right? From a slimy glove, grub, or I don't know if they're slimy or not. Caterpillar. I, I only see them when I step on them, so they're always slimy. From a caterpillar metamorphosized into a beautiful butterfly. So complete metamorphosis. Anybody want to hazard a guess as to uh, who we're talking about today? I think it was actually on the, in the email. I'm sorry? Saul would be a good one. Yeah, yeah. He's not in Joshua 2. But Saul is, I mean, that is, yeah, definitely the right, a, a right answer. Rahab. Rahab. Of course Rahab. Joshua chapter 2, and she's also mentioned in Joshua chapter 6, which is when they go in and actually rescue her. Moses has been leading God's people for 40 years, and he's just handed the reins over to Joshua. Do you remember why he had to hand the reins over? Because he was about to <laughs> die. I love it. <laughs> yes, he was about to kick the bucket. He was about to assume room temperature. Okay, anyway. That's, that's tacky. I'm sorry. And so he hands the reins over to Joshua. Now, do we remember why he didn't get to go to the promised land he had been tasked to lead these people to? 
He took credit for the water from the rock when he struck it instead of giving credit to God. Hmm. Did he bear false witness? Hmm. Interesting. Anyway, just a little side Bible trivia thing there. Disobedience. Hang on to that because that comes into play over and over in today's lesson. He's just been, Joshua has just been handed over the reins and he approaches the people and he tells the people to gather around and to time to move forward to execute God's promise to them. And they declare their fidelity to him. They declare their faithfulness to him. They will follow him and take his words as words from the Lord as they did with Moses. So this is a big moment in Israel's history. They are at just on the doorsteps of the promised land. They've been wandering in the desert for 40 years after being miraculously taken out of Egypt. And now the promise is coming to fulfillment. They approach a fortified city named Jericho that stands in their way. And it's actually the very city that knocked them back out into the desert for 40 years the first time God was trying to lead them into the promised land. If you remember in Numbers chapter 13, it says, For while the land flowed with milk and honey, it was full of people who were great in size and powerful, and their cities were heavily fortified, and we seemed like grasshoppers to them. That was the report the spies gave the first time. Well, except for Joshua and Caleb. God had promised them this land, but the people feared Jericho and the other cities more than they trusted God. And so God said, all right, strap up your sandals. You're going to have some time to think about it, 40 years to be exact. Back to the desert you go. Now, consequently, 40 years is the same number of years that Robert and Rebecca were married the last time we owned them in 2013. Now, I'm not saying that, you know, they've been in the desert for 40 years and, you know, burning up and it's been hard. I'm not saying that at all. I'm not saying that. It just is a nice coincidence and, you know, something to ponder. 40. <laughs> 40 is a good biblical number. Remember that four is the number for architecture, for purposeful design, especially for God's purposeful design. And 10 is one of the numbers for God's perfection, God's completion. So you have God's planning and God's architecture alongside of God's completion. 40 years, a purposeful time in the desert to build, to rebuild his people into the trusting people that they needed to be in order to conquer. I say in order to conquer. God did the conquering, but in order to follow God into the promised land. So 40 years later, something is different. Something is very different. They trust God this time around. And maybe 40 years in the desert will do that for you. Trusting God for your meals in the desert. And any time they ran against an opposing king, God took care of it. This ragtag group of people, nomads in the desert, were powerful. Not because they themselves were powerful, but because the God who led them was powerful. They were led by Moses. Their perspective changed. And instead of trusting in their own strength or their own lack of strength, as the case may have been when they first explored the land of Joshua and its neighbors, they began to learn their perspective changed that they could fully trust in God. And that's, again, incredible. And I'm going to repeat what I think is one of the most important things about this idea of trust, trusting God. Your attitude or your perspective either supports trusting God or it crumbles your trust in God. I'll say that one more time. Your attitude, your perspective either supports trusting God or it crumbles your trust in in God. That's the story of Rahab. Ultimately, who do you trust? And what 
does living that trust look like? All right, very quickly. <laughs> I can hear you laughing on the inside. Joshua, oh, chapter 20, chapter 2. Oh, we're going to have to move. So Joshua sends two spies to view the land, especially Jericho, and they go in. And I love this. They went and in, went into the house of a prostitute who was named Rahab and lodged there. Now, I always wondered why they did that. It's always good to have some commentaries around because they have good ideas. And what the general consensus was, if you don't want to be noticed, go to the house of a prostitute, especially in that day and age because it was everybody went in and out, a lot of traffic. Nobody's going nobody's to see you. You're, you're going to be kind of a forgotten entity. And so while they were doing their scouting, they went in, hopefully not to get noticed, and yet they did. And some folks went and told the king of Jericho that the men of Israel have gone into the house of Rahab. So the king sends guards, I'm assuming, to Rahab's home, bring the men out. She said, it's true that they were here, but I didn't know where they were from. And when the gate was about to be closed at dark, the men went out. I don't know where they went, but if you pursue them quickly, you may overtake them. But she had taken them up to the top of her roof, hid them in the stalks of flax that she laid out on the roof. So the men pursued them, on the way to the Jordan as far as the Forbes. Now that's, I believe that's heading west from there. And the gate was shut as soon as the pursuers had gone out. Now before Joshua's spies laid down, Rahab goes up to the roof and says to them, and listen to this conversation. I know that the Lord, and she uses the formal name of God, Yahweh. I know that Yahweh has given you the land. You hear that? You hear that faith? I know that Yahweh has given you the land. That's how she starts out this conversation with these, with these guys that she's hiding. And that the fear of you has fallen upon us. Isn't that interesting? 40 years prior, it was the spies who came back afraid. We're like grasshoppers to them. They can step on us and squash us. They can dribble chocolate on us and eat us. So they're weird. But this time, Jericho is afraid. All the inhabitants of the land will melt away before you. For we have Heard, and you remember how important that word is in, in, in the Old Testament. Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God, the Lord is the Shema. The daily morning prayer, the first thing that they said in the mornings. The covenant with God. Their promise that the words that they hear from God, they will live. To hear for the Jew is to understand and to put into play in life. And so when she says, we have heard how the Lord, and that's Adonai there, dried up the water of the Red Sea before you when you came out of Egypt, and what you did to the other kings of the Amorites that were beyond the Jordan, and to Sion, and to Og, whom you devastated to destruction, whom you devoted to destruction, I'm sorry whom you purposefully completely destroyed and left nothing, no one there. As soon as we heard it, our hearts melted. There was no spirit left in any man because of you. For Yahweh, your God, he is God in the heavens above and on the earth beneath. He is God everywhere. Do you hear her trust? Do you hear her faith? Do you hear her perspective about who Yahweh God is? Sounds a lot like the reading, doesn't it? 
Now then, please swear to me by the Lord. Take an oath by Yahweh's great name. As I have dealt kindly, that word is chesed, <clears throat> that word that we love and treasure so much. Translated as steadfast love. That's why we're saying the steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His chesed never ceases. It's the word in Psalm 136 that is repeated over and over and over as, as the leader says, this is what God has done. And the congregation repeats back, the steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. It's the word in Ruth when Naomi bursts forth this great kindness that this relative has done for us to give us this grand amount of food and to protect you out in the fields while gleaning. The kindness of God flowed through Boaz. And God used that kindness. God is that kindness, that steadfast love, that purposeful blessing to his people. And so she says, as I have dealt chesed with you, will you deal chesed with me, with my father's house, and give me a sure sign? Now, if you have a paper Bible, and if you can do that in your, if you can do this in your electronic Bible, that word in the ESV that's translated sure in verse 12, and then the spies answer and use a word faithfully, down in verse 14, that is the same Hebrew word. That word is emet. It is true. It is reliable. It is count onable. It's faithful. In fact, Psalm 25, verse 10, uses this word. And I think, yes, I did. And also, um, I'm going to get to that in a second. Hang on to that. The combination of chesed and emet is used in the Psalms at least three different times. I'm going to read those in a second, but let me read the, the rest of this conversation first. So twice she has used this word chesed. As I have dealt chesed with you, kindly with you, deal kindly with me and my father's house and give me a rock solid sign, something that I can count on, something I know you're telling the truth, that you will save Alive, my father, my mother, my brothers and sisters, and all who belong to them, and deliver our lives from death. The men said to her, Our life for yours, even to death, pledging at that moment that they would protect her and her family, even if it cost them their own lives, for the great kindness she was showing them at this moment. There's a caveat if you do not tell this business of ours, and when the Lord gives us this land, I love that. Not when we come in and take over the land. When the Lord gives us this land, we will come in when the Lord says to come in. We will be obedient to God, even in the gifts he has promised us. We will deal kindly and faithfully with you. There's that combination of those two words put together. Interesting that chesed is used three times. Remember what that is? Spiritual perfection, covenant based on God's kindness is a beautiful, wonderful thing. Listen to Psalm 25, 10, Psalm 86, 15, and Psalm 117, verse 2. All the paths of, the, all the paths of Yahweh are steadfast love and faithfulness for those who keep his covenant and his testimonies. You hear that caveat? For those who keep his covenant and his testimonies. But you, O Lord, Adonai, are a great and merciful and gracious God, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. For great is his steadfast love towards us, and the faithfulness of Yahweh endures forever. Praise Yahweh. We often say that biblical love is unconditional love. There are levels, that is true. You can never outrun the grace of God. You can never have done so much that God will not take you back. 
So in that way, God's love is unconditional. It is unending. But in order to have the Lord's favor, His active will flowing through you, shaping you, molding you, preparing you for those good works in advance that He's setting out. It takes extreme obedience. That condition of, God, your ways are better than mine. I trust them, so I will learn them and live by them. So they covenant. They will protect her as she has protected them. She lets him down through a rope through the window. Her house was built into the city wall. And I don't know why I'd never thought about this, but you know, when, remember when they, they circled the city, circled the city all week long, once a day, and then the seventh day, they seven times, and the walls fall? I mean, was her little house just sitting there? I, I, don't, I never wondered about that before. And if so, yes, sir. It must not have her. It would have killed him, right? That's good to know. So when that section's standing up, well, I guess, I don't guess everybody went, hey, how'd that happen? Because they were all... No, that's, real, that's, that's very good to know. Thank you for sharing that. Um, so the archaeological, for those on Zoom, archaeological evidence shows that there's a three to four room section where that part of the wall didn't fall. The rest of the city wall, straight down. It's just amazing. Just absolutely amazing. The miracles that God works for and through his people when they are obedient. It took 40 years for the children of Israel to get to the point of obedience that they would follow God into the city that was promised. And when they obeyed, I mean, what a silly military tactic. Walk around the city once a day for six days and then seven times on the seventh day. Oh, really? And then we're going to attack? We're going to be exhausted. I mean, this is a city. It's not like walking around the mall seven times, which would be exhausting enough. It's a city. But that's what he told them to do. That's what they did. And it went their way because God was leading them and God was doing the doing. There's a conversation that happens after she is preparing to let them down that we don't have time to go into. But they confirm again with her that she has to be true to her word not to reveal their presence, not to reveal what they had done or what they had promised her, that if any of this business of ours is revealed, then they would be guiltless in not rescuing her. Rahab remained obedient even after they left. Okay. That's the, the story real quick. No, maybe not so real quick, but, you know, that's the story. The story of Rahab, who do you trust? And what does that look like in real life? Rahab was transformed in that moment and in that faithfulness from a caterpillar to a butterfly, from a slug to a princess, from a throwaway life to an ancestor of David and a nearby ancestor of David. Listen to this in Matthew chapter 1. This is the genealogy of Jesus, the Messiah, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Abraham, the father of Isaac, Isaac, the father of Jacob, Jacob, the father of Judah and his brothers, Judah, the father of Perez and Zerah, whose mother was Tamar. Another interesting story. Perez, the father of Hezron, Hezron, the father of Ram, Ram, the father of Amin Aminadab, Aminadab, the father of Nashon. Actually, it's Nashon. Nashon, the father of Salmon. Salmon, the father of Boaz, whose mother was Rahab. Oh, didn't I mention Boaz a little bit earlier? Hmm. And how he was identified as one of giving great kindness. Hmm. 
Boaz, the father of Obed, whose mother was Ruth, Obed, the father of Jesse, Jesse, the father of King David. And David, obviously, in the lineage of Jesus. It's a prostitute in the lineage of our Lord and Savior. Rahab is the gospel story. There is nothing you can do that is so bad that God can not only forgive you, but rescue you and lift you up and use you to do mighty things in the kingdom. God does not limit us by our past. God grows us according to our trust. Rahab is a microcosm not just of the gospel, but of the story of Israel, which is also a part of our great gospel. The importance of extreme obedience. It took 40 years for Israel to, to learn to follow God enough to go into that city and take that city and the land that surrounded it, that they had been promised. Rahab shows that in trust and in faith, God can do great and wonderful things. Rahab knew that if Yahweh is coming, his people are already victorious. Rahab knew that though Jericho's citizens were fearful, that she could be confident because she had this hope that they would be kind to her as she was to them because she knew that God's people were serious about covenant as God was serious about covenant. Rahab knew, Rahab trusted that if Yahweh is coming, it is as good as done. If we seek God's favor, if we seek God's kindness, we need to not just know but understand why it takes extreme obedience to his law and his leading. That's why I read out of the Psalms. And one of the things I loved about Scott's class this morning. The Jewish nation, the ones that were getting it right, David and, and the others, loved God's law. They saw it as the, great, as the great secrets to life. This world throws at us so many perspectives, so many ideas, so many theories. It's gods that are rich. It's gods that are good. It's gods that are healthy. And when you live looking forward to living those out, it opens the door for God's great work in us. God does powerful and wonderful and beautiful things with those and through those whose lives are lives of extreme obedience. And the ultimate example of this is our Jesus. Over and over in the Gospel of John, and Dave brought this out as he was going over John's Gospel. Jesus came to reveal God, John 1.18. And the way he revealed God was to be perfectly obedient to him. Whatever God said for him to do, he did. Whatever God told him to say, he said. Over and over in John, you hear Jesus say, I do as the Father has commanded me. I, these words that I speak are the words of the Father. This is the Jesus we follow. This is the Jesus we submit to. One who trusted the Father so much that he gave his very life to do the Father's will. And he asks us to trust him in the same way and enjoy complete metamorphosis away from this world's rules and standards and understandings to God's kindness and faithfulness and goodness. She's called Rahab the prostitute throughout Scripture. In James, in the same way was not also Rahab the prostitute justified by works when she received the messengers and sent them away by another way? For as the body apart from the spirit is dead, so faith apart from works is dead. James, Mr. Practical, says you can't have faith without works. You can't say you believe something if you're not living it. You can't separate the two. It's one and the same. And he used Rahab the prostitute as an example. 
in Hebrews chapter 11, the great, you know, here comes the hall of fame of faith. By faith, when the people crossed the Red Sea on dry land, but the Egyptians, when they attempted to do so, were drowned. By faith, the walls of Jericho, and remember, this Greek word for faith can be, tr can be translated believe or trust. trust. Right. So let's read it that way. By trust, the people crossed the Red Sea on dry land, but the Egyptians, when they attempted to do the same, were drowned. By trust, the walls of Jericho fell down after they had been encircled for seven days. By trust, Rahab the prostitute did not perish with those who were disobedient because she had given a friendly welcome to the spies. Rahab the prostitute. And yet, despite that moniker, despite that name tag, she's held up as an example of righteousness. I mean, why? 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 Poor Rahab. We don't say David the murderer, David the adulterer, Paul the killer, Samson the delilah -er. Maybe, maybe, and this is just a guess, it's because the truth, the depth, the beauty of the gospel is what her life reveals. It's a desperate, it's a story that we desperately want for ourselves not to be known. Well, not to be defined by our past. We want to be a king like David, but many of us at one point in our lives have felt broken, worthless, misused, abused. And yet the true story of the gospel, the true story that Jesus died to tell, is that we are highly valued, highly loved, and greatly useful in the kingdom of God, regardless of where we're from, where we were when we were found. Because we trust, we trust that the God who created all things, as Ron so beautifully put at table, can, through his footstep-following believers, lift up even one the world has deemed worthless. And not only can he lift them up, and I love Ephesians does this as well in the first three chapters, not just lift us up out of our sin, but into the very throne room of God Almighty and gives us a call and an opportunity to serve the King of Kings. There are moments in our lives when we have to decide what is most important and who we truly serve. Do I serve my story, my interests? Do I submit to my fears and my failures? Or do I trust in God's story, in God's coming, in God's presence, and choose to be a part of that story like Rahab did? Where we serve God's interests and not our own, where we where God's pleasure is the greatest of our desires, where God's pride begins to overflow towards us, where God's presence in us becomes victorious, and we become a joy-filled, heaven-promised, eternally loved and valued part of the story of the great kingdom of God. And when we can claim that when we can rest in that, we don't have to hide our humanity anymore. We don't have to hide our past because that's where God met us. And that's where God lifted us out. And that's where God secured our great and everlasting future. And the truth is that our scars or our battle wounds are evidence of His great healing, His great rescue, and His work in and through us. He is our ever lasting God. He is the defender of the weak. He wipes our slate clean and he sees us as holy. Remember how Jen described holy to us. 
set aside for a specific work. And in this case, set aside for the work of God. We are privileged to be a part of his continuing story, his everlasting story, just as, just as Rahab is. So if you want to call a Rahab the prostitute, well, that's fine. I think when I get to heaven, I'm not really sure if I'm going to call her Rahab the prostitute, though I'm sure she would smile and say, used to be, not anymore. And it was a great story. You want to hear my perspective of it? Yes, I really do. Or maybe I'll call her Rahab the righteous. You hid the spies, and you will forever be remembered for that act, and I believe for your understanding of God's chesed, God's kindness, because you passed it down to your children, and they passed it down to their children. And those children gave us David, and those children gave us Jesus. Well done, Rahab, the righteous. You understood the beauty and the significance and the value of God's kindness living in you. You understood the beauty and the significance of the reality of God in His presence in you. Here's the truth of the matter. The consequences of Rahab's first lifestyle eventually to be thrown out like the trash, disregarded, and of no value except for a few moments of pleasure with no concern for her. But the consequences of her God-given lifestyle landed her in the lineage of our Savior and her soul eternally in the presence of Almighty God. Rahab the prostitute, Rahab the righteous, Rahab the one who understood kindness. Trust God, live his story. Nobody said it would be easy. But if we believe that God is with us, if we trust that God is with us, when we need it most, God's strength will rise. And we can do the kind thing, the right thing, for His kingdom, for His honor, and by the proper use of His name. And we know that that is so true, and we trust that it is so true, praise team, that we can be strong and courageous in our daily walk as we enter the Jerichos that are in front of us. God has already been there. God is making the way. And I would venture to say that there's probably a Rahab or two that God wants us to exchange kindnesses with and bring them along for the journey. Let's stand and sing this song of encouragement. Be strong and courageous. God.